All right, Scott, thanks again for being back on Wicked Smart Golf Part 3 today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. It's always fun. Yeah, it's been funny. I was uh, looking back. I have a, a time hop app where it shows you what you did a year, two years ago, five years ago, all that. And a couple years ago, I had a screenshot. I was like, oh, I remember reaching out to Scott Fawcett. Hopefully he says yes to the podcast. And uh, you're one of the first big guests and kind of uh, ironic. Here we are two years later and we're doing part three. And uh, like I said, my audience absolutely loves Decade. I know we were talking about how many people have signed up before. So, you know, once again, just want to say thanks for uh, helping golfers like myself and so much of our audience uh, has found a ton of benefit from it. Of course. I mean, it is fun. I mean, honestly, so I tend to get in my little silo here in my office where I don't, I just feel like I'm talking to air. I mean, all the time, I understand like there's interaction on social media and whatever, but sometimes it's like, you know, is this thing on? And so, you know, I went out to the live event a couple of weeks ago here in Dallas, the team championship. And I had at least, I would think 20 people come up and say thanks and like take pictures, which just feels super, super weird. Um, and then played in the pro scratch this, these last two days here for the North Texas PGA and had a number of people come up and say stuff. So, it, I mean, it is weird, but it's also nice to know helping people at scale that you just never even know. I mean, I've been telling people, this, this is crazy. We sold a, a membership in Ukraine last week and I'm like, don't you have something going on? <laughs> like, it's so wild. <laughs> that is wild. Yeah, just looking at daily sales, like where they come from. I'm looking at Canada, Australia, UK, America this year, India, Singapore. Like that's today. That's just so weird to me. How many countries are you in? I have no idea. It never, nothing I would have ever even thought to track. <laughs> Anywhere there's an app store, I guess. Yeah, that's amazing, man. Well, it's uh, it's it's easy to see why. And that's actually kind of where I wanted to start is like where, you know, in terms of like mistakes are amateur golfers making? Because I feel like when I learned Decade a couple of years ago, I realized I was pretty much making every mistake out there in terms of course management. So what do you think are some of the biggest mistakes most amateurs make and how can Decade help? I mean, it's just such a canned answer, but it's just, not hitting driver enough off the tee, not hitting driver as hard as you can. Um, certainly chasing too many pins. And then just when they work on their putting, they just work on their putting stroke and not their speed control. And it's so funny. Cause like some of the things I say, like it's don't, don't I'm not saying that I do them. I mean, my putting has been horrific this year, <laughs> but I really don't care. I like hitting balls. So like my limited time, I want to go out and enjoy hitting golf balls. And so it's, it is funny that, that, here's the speed drills that Maverick, you know, McNeely and Zalatoris and these guys used to become great putters. And I know everyone probably scratching the head when I say Zalatoris, great putter, but like his speed control is incredible, which is what allows him to be basically an average putter out there. And, you know, there's times when I'm like, oh, I should really do those speed drills. And I'm like, I've got 45 minutes. Like <laughs> I can hit balls for 15 minutes and then putt for 30. I'll just hit balls for 45 minutes. And it's, it's finally caught up to me now with champions tour Q school six weeks away that I, I need to, get busy on it, but we, we all make the same mistakes. I mean, it's just, it's so repetitive. And and another one my amateurs make is trying chip shots and flop shots that are just outside of their skill set and making silly doubles and, you know, just everything that leads to the tiger five mistakes, which for those scoring at home, how many doubles did you have? How many bogeys on par fives? How many three putts? How many bogeys inside of 150 yards and how many blown easy saves, which we changed into to two, two chips. It's, those five things are what the amateurs do wrong and it's what the professionals do wrong. <clears throat> yeah. It is shocking how every round I look at those tiger five, I'm like, man, it's just, it's always the, that like one or two shots. Like you said, there's all, we're always trying to get one back. And I think the, it's like you read my notes here. Cause the next thing I want to talk about, cause we talked about it two years ago in the first episode was the importance of hitting driver. And I just don't think people understand why it is so important. So why should golfers hit driver more often and should they do a fairway finder, uh, a full driver, or is it just one shot all the time? With the driver specifically, it is one shot all the time. And again, I've, I've decided to die on this hill however many years ago. And at this point, I think the people that I'm arguing with, they're the ones now deciding to die on this hill on the contrarian side. Because <clears throat> the one thing that I finally realized two years ago when Scotty Scheffler was playing in the Masters, they asked him, you know, why don't you hit driver on 10? And he said, well, I mean, my driver's fit for a fade. So when I try to turn it over, it's just a mid, you know, teens, you know, 15, 1600 RPM uh, spin rate knuckleball. And I was like, I'd never really thought about explaining it that way. Personally, I've known that just shaping it one direction allows you to eliminate double crosses, which are basically the, the biggest problem in golf is when you when you don't shape the ball the direction you want. 
But once Scotty said that, I was like, there's really the answer. And it's probably an answer as to why there are so many more double crosses because the driver's the only club in the bag that you fit for a specific shape. It's not like in a driver fitting, you're doing the nine box drill, hitting all the different trajectories and shapes. You're just hitting your shot in a simulator. And so if you happen to hit a fade, if you, then again, I'm just making up numbers here, but like for me, a, a perfect shot is about 2,200 RPM, 14 degree launch, you know, 168 ball speed type thing. If I try to turn that driver over, it's just going to be a knuckleball. The flip side is if I had the exact same launch conditions and was hitting a draw, when I try to fade it, it would just be kind of a spinny flare. And so then you talk about like your, your teed down fairway finder. That's maybe okay ish. Um, as long as you're shaping it the same direction, personally, I'm just a big fan of if it's not a full driver, then just hit your next club down. It's fit for whatever it is you're trying to do. Because again, I, I hate saying it constantly on every single podcast that I'm on, but I really drive the golf ball well. And finally, actually, I did a, a video with Garrett from Good Good where I had him out to play in our one day member guest at my home course. And we filmed it. So now I can finally actually show people, hey, I'm not kidding. I drove this thing on a string the entire day. I hit every single green and shot 65. And it was obviously great to have that on film as a person who talks about playing golf for a living. But he's just, by the end of it, he's like, dude, you just do the same thing every single time. And and again, I, I'm really, I'm like for about two months now almost, I'm, I'm hitting it so good it's ridiculous. But once you are just good at doing one thing, it's just, I mean, again, I'm not going to say it, this is all relative to your handicap and blah, 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 other, other caveats, but once you're good at doing one thing, it's not that hard to keep doing it. It's when you're trying to move your, your, your path around relative to face and just all this stuff, you're just making it a lot harder than it needs to be. And then almost as important, like, unless you're literally trying to become one of the, I, 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 like I'll, I'll surrender. Okay. If you want to become one of the best players on the planet, maybe you need to be able to work your irons both directions. Maybe. I still don't even think that's true because DJ is a master at it. But like I'm playing to a plus five right now and I haven't hit a single draw in, I mean, literally 10 years on purpose um, or that didn't involve a tree. Like it can be done. That is uh, that's impressive uh, on the uh, 10, <clears throat> one decade without hitting a draw. I am curious, though, what are you doing so well with driver? Because I know that that is such an area for guys to improve. I know distance is key to, you know, longer distances correlate to lower handicaps. What do you feel like you're doing or have developed? I mean, obviously, you've hit endless golf balls over the years. You were a pro. You've had lessons. You've done all the things. But like, what do you think makes a good driver? Is it, um, you know, the club? Is it a certain drill you do? just playing one shot shape. I just love to just try and extract more because I feel like you've simplified driving and that's where so many guys struggle at. I truly think it comes down. I mean, first of all, like, again, I'm trying to be as honest about, I'm a pretty big athletic guy, you, you know, so maybe I am a bit of a unicorn with it. Like, and, and it, it's not something everyone can do. I, I really don't know. I just, as, as the person we're talking about, like I have a hard time believing I'm a unicorn, but it's certainly possible. That being said, by just doing the same thing over and over and over again, you just, it just becomes where it's, it's just on autopilot. I mean, again, I really, I really do believe that also. And so I've got, you know, the spot 18 inches in front of the ball that I'm using. Like when I, back in the day, when I was really doing this, I would take an alignment rod or, or piece of string. Actually, that's something I, I got from uh, Wyndham Clark is taking just like string to where you can actually hit balls, like even irons. You set the ball down on the string. And so you're seeing that line. And then all I'm doing is I've, I've got, a, you know, alignment rod. I've got that string down. I'm just walking in. I'm just personally, I'm a pretty traditional swinging guy. I'm squaring everything to my start line. And then I'm basically swinging on that with the face a little bit open to it, which basically just hits a little bleeding cut every single time. And again, more than anything, I just, I just literally, I, I might hit a little toe draw but I'm never going to snap hook it. Like, it's just, it's just not even going to happen. And I'm so hexing myself for champions tour <laughs> Q school coming up. But I mean, I just, I just laugh at how much easier the game can be. Again, I'm 51 now. So my ball speed, unfortunately is, is dropping almost on a exponential rate right now, but I'm still in the high one sixties ball speed and the ball just goes the direction I meant it to go every time. And so once you can do that, 
So I've got my body lines and all that, you know, let's pretend there's just no wind. I've got my body lines set up right down the left side of the fairway and I'll hit anything from a pull. I'll definitely pull it. Mm -hmm. It just won't turn over anything from a pull to a 50 yard cut. And it's funny. Cause like, again, I just played in the pro scratch with my, one of my assistants from Stonebriar this week. And I had, I, I just had striped it for like the first 13 holes off the tee. And on 14, I finally, I did, I hit kind of a flary looking floater. And the guy that I was playing, he goes, Oh, get down. And I was like, that's fine. And his partner goes, get down. It's in the fairway. Like <laughs> it was, a, I mean, granted it was a big fairway, but like it just, all of a sudden it kind of catches you off guard. Like, Oh my God, that one finally looked bad. And it's like, yeah, but it went the direction I meant it to go. And so there's a lot of room to work with. Once you're, again, I, I do firmly believe that once you're trying to alter the face to path relationship, you lose this feel for keeping the face on the target side of path, if that makes sense. So if my path, I'm making up numbers here, is, is four degrees left of the ultimate target. Mm -hmm. And that's where my body lines and everything are. As long as I can keep the face on the target side of path, it's probably going to be a decent shot. I mean, it's not going to be a terrible shot. And golf is really more about your, your score is far more determined by the quality of your bad shots than the quality of your good shots. And so I just don't get it in trouble off the tee very often which from there, once you're playing with kind of air quotes, proper strategy, you're going to hit a ton of greens. And again, I, I really feel weird saying this because it's all tongue in cheek and relative to your ability. After that point, it's just not that hard. And, and again, it really is actually more to this paradox I used to talk about that golf is so hard that you have to play it correctly. And once you're playing it correctly, it's actually not that hard. Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like, your driver, I mean, as, as many swing, swings I've seen you do, and I think that's been a theme in all of them, is just your consistency. And I remember even in the decade program, you mm -hmm. talked about how you used to walk through your routine. Didn't you wear a GoPro on your head and you kind of did that? I'm curious, yeah. how do you pick targets? What Are you someone that likes zones? Do you just pick one small target? Because I feel like that's a big part of it, right? Getting our mind ready for the shot. How do you pick targets? Well, they, in my opinion, they have to be extraordinarily small and specific. Um, again, just vague. That's when people, someone's like, Oh, I'm a field player. Like we well, mm -hmm. still should pick a target. And I feel like zones is way too vague. And, and it's, it gets back to the people talking about that sniper mentality of aim, small, miss small. And I actually think that it's no aim small and understand you're going to miss big, especially in golf and, and like being prepared for that. So yes, on approach shots, you know, at this point I own decade strategy in my head. Like I kind of know where to be aiming shots and, 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 picking a lip of a bunker, uh, you know, some spot in a tree. Like I had a couple shots this week where there was trees in the background and I was able to find a branch. I, I want you to find something for your actual target that just stands out to you. Even if it's a yard or two away from the, op, you know, air quotes, optimal target. I want you when you're walking in to just be able to, when you look up towards the target, I want your eyes just to see it immediately. I don't want you to slow mm -hmm. down like, where was I aiming this again? Yeah. And again, this gets back to what I talk about all the time with just block practicing on the range, which is just putting an alignment stick down and hitting at the exact same target all the way through the bag <laughs> and just getting really good at that pre-shot routine. And, and, you know, again, looking up, going through your, your inner conversation and then just letting it go. I mean, that's, again, I really do believe that if there's any one thing I've really harped on that I think is different in golf, it's this idea of expectation management. And just having realistic expectations is just vital to not imploding. Um, no offense to my partner from the last two weeks or last two days. Uh, if you're listening, Paul, love you, buddy. But the first round, he was so focused on score and the leaderboard and just everything but the next shot at hand. Like he was just so wrapped up in it. And I, I kept telling him like, hey, man, let's just play. Let's just play. But he was so worked up and he just played terrible. And then the next day I said, the first day I was like, all right, let's make a deal. We're not going to look at the leaderboard at all today. What's the point? And he played much better. You know, he had a streak there. We parred like nine out of the 10 holes and like, it was, it was much better, but it's just, it's just all about expectation management. It really is. Yeah. You've, you've taught me a lot with driver and, and I only do that one drill when I'm at the range, you know, obviously work on my routine a lot, talk about a lot on the podcast. The last question I had with the driver was wind. You know, we have, you have a lot of wind, obviously where you're at. Uh, we don't have a ton here, but anytime it came up this year, I was terrible at it. And so I'm curious what you think, it, do you make any changes with driver, with target selection, with your T height club, ball position, anything changing with wind? 
I do not personally. And again, that's, okay. I'll say that I got far more committed to that after working with Keith Mitchell, who is the best driver of the golf ball on the planet, not named Rory McIlroy. <laughs> and, you know, Keith, the first time that we spent time together is at the Byron Nelson here in Dallas. And we're just talking about it all. And he's just like, I don't change anything ever. And number nine is this par five that it's kind of an awkward little tee shot. It's like, it's kind of a dog leg left, but it's like 270 to this corner and there's tall trees. So you can't really cut it off. Like it's a spot that you really need to draw it. I mean, there's no two ways about it. Back when I had corn fairy status, I always got up there and tried to draw it on that hole again. This was back uh, 15 years ago, pre pre decade. So I was still an idiot. And I went out there and literally kind of hid in a tree near the tee box. Cause I wanted to see, okay, Keith, <laughs> you tee it really high and you unload, you know, unleash on this fade every single time. And sure enough, he just stepped back there, teed at the same height, everything looked the same and just hit this cut out there. And I was just like, there you go. I mean, this is literally the best driver consistently year in year out of the ball on the planet. And so it, again, I had already really committed to it, but watching that was just, I mean, it was just an exhibition and the guy is just an exhibition with the driver every single time he tees it up. And like I say, I definitely had already only played fades, but it's like, it's like watching him do that gave me this extra confidence that this mm. is correct. Mm -hmm. And then again, I've just really dug into this is right. And again, with wind, let's say it's blowing off the left. <clears throat> I'm just going to play for it. You know, just ship it out there because again, this is what people, I don't think they understand. Let's just pretend we got a, a wind that's 15 off the left. Well, if I'm a guy that fades it on every shot, and now I'm going to stand up there and try to hit a little hold draw and my miss. And in my experience, it is about 25 ish percent of the time you hit this little double cross. <laughs> so now you've started it further right than you normally would have because you're going to hit a hold draw and your miss is a block cut with 15 off the left. Like that is always in someone's pool. Yep. And if there's any one thing you cannot have in golf, it's penalty shots. And that's, you know, that's just the way it is, in my opinion. So now if the wind is off the right, same amount, I'm not going to try to hit some toe ball and ride it. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to then hit basically what would look like just a perfect hold, you know, straight ball fade with that wind into the wind. I mean, am, am I really going to lower my trajectory much <laughs> without really changing my swing, which is then going to change my wrist angles, my face to path relationship, like good luck, especially into the wind, because that's just going to amplify your directional mistake. Like you just predictability of curve, I think is, is probably the number one trait that great players have. I think everybody needed to hear that myself included. I think it actually makes it easier because you're just trying to do one thing for the rest of your life. So I think that that hopefully well, will help people a little bit simplify it. I, right. I came across, I was looking for something recently and I came across this I used to post a lot on this online poker forum called two plus two. And I came across this screenshot of, of one post that I had written with Zalatoris way back in the day when he was only 15. And I had, I, I had played a pretty good round that day and was just kind of like giving some highlights of it in this golf forum. And in there, I mean, again, this is predates even decade because Will's 15 decade came around when Will was 17, when I started caddying for him. Um, and, and he had said that day, I literally remember it too. He's like, dude, it's just so boring watching you. Like, Every single time you're walking up the tee, I know exactly what you're going to do. There's no, there's no thought involved. And I do believe that there's this like paradox of choice where you've got all of these options, which again, Will can hit the nine ball drill. He can do it like you can't even imagine on the range, but it, it, it looks pretty, but I don't even, I don't know that it's actually any more effective. There's that one photo that always circulates from Cam Young, where he's like the nine ball drill off some tee or something. And it's like, look at this. And it's like all the shapes and the shot pattern is like a thousand yards wide. It's like, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I can do that, but does it actually go where I'm trying to make it go? I mean, right. that's one thing Lou did a great study one time of players with seven irons and shaping the ball and everything where he had them hit like, you know, with a launch monitor of at least like a, it was like a $2,000 launch monitor or better, whichever one that I can't remember the one is where he had to hit off the laser dot anyways. And he had players hit it hard hit it stock and hit it soft and actually the harder they hit it the better their distance control became but their directional control became a little bit wider and then the soft shot the shot pattern got wider and less distance control and it's just like again if if i get it if there's a pin on the back left well this this course we just played this week 
greens were really firm and fast. It was a little bit windy yesterday. And if there's a back left pin somewhere where I've got like a seven iron in, like, yeah, I'm going to probably start it at the pin and cut it towards the middle. And everyone's like, well, it's just always working away from the flag. I'm like, yeah. And hitting the green and two putting given those characteristics is a phenomenal result. Technically. Like you're worried about getting a look at birdie. I mean, it's a, it's your 170 on firm, fast greens. And you're worried about getting a look at birdie. Just hit the green and two putt it, tip your cap and move on. Are you still a pro uh, mini driver? Cause I remember a couple years ago, you loved that club. I think you probably gave Taylor made a million dollars in sales because that, that clip I had of you went super viral on TikTok and Instagram. What are your thoughts on the mini driver? Should we replace three wood? I think the vast majority of people should replace three wood and potentially depending on how your driver is for most people, you know, with slower swing, swing speeds, it's probably better than their driver form. Again, go get a fitting, everything else. Like, mm -hmm. but yes, I am still the leader of team mini driver. Now my only problem is, so I, you asked me before we started how my game is. And I was like, ah, hey, let's just talk about it on the show. La last year I realized like, so I had a surgery on both my elbows back in 2021. And so leading into that over the five or six years, I just didn't play much golf. And when I did, it hurt. So I got to where I would just pick the ball off the ground, like literally lob wedge, no divot and not like a cool tiger way where he still <laughs> got forward shaft lean, but then is ripping it up so fast that he's still hitting a lob wedge, you know, a hundred yards. I'm, I'm in a, Hey, I'm hitting a lob wedge about 65 or 70 yards because there's no vertical shaft lean whatsoever. And so I decided last year, okay, if I'm going to work on my game, I really need to bring my ball flight down, get hitting my irons a little bit longer. And I started working with a guy this year and I know everything we were doing was correct, but I just couldn't do it. So it, it, it involved, you know, like, like getting a little bit more of lead wrist flexion and then trying to like kind of shut the face down. And I just lost all feel for where the face is, which is vital to me. And so I, I wound up just scratch, you know, so I, I qualified for the U S senior open, but I was kind of like on this starting to go downhill with my ball striking. Cause I was really trying hard to make this adjustment, especially going to the senior open at Newport beach uh, at Newport in Rhode Island, where it's just windy every day, right there on the coast. And I just, I mean, it was bad. I mean, I shot 75, 75, which was honestly as good as I possibly could have done given how I was hitting it. I came home and I, the next weekend I shot 83, which I haven't shot in the eighties, like since college, um, shot 83 in a Ryder cup qualifier here at my home course. And I was like, okay, that didn't work. <laughs> I took a week, took my kids to Disney. And honestly, I just watched video of myself from last year, just trying to like regain that feel mm -hmm. and went out when I got home and just, I mean, immediately started striping And The next two rounds I shot 74 and 72, not great, but I did it with five and six birdies. Um, and then the following weekend in another qualifier shot 63 on, I mean, on a course, we're talking 75 and a half score, you know, course rating. And I have just striped it since now, what was your question when I started leading them? And I was like, just the, just why the mini driver is such a good play. Oh, mini driver. Right. So part of, I abandoned the whole, I need to hit my irons further. So like right now, if I'm one seventeen or 18, like I'm just bunting a pitching wedge, which again, for a guy with ball speeds in the yeah. high 160s and right at 170, it's comical how short I'm hitting my short irons, especially. So I did drop my mini driver in order to add a nuclear hybrid in there because my three iron, I was carrying maybe 225. And there's just some spots where like, I kind of need a 240, 45 carry more than I need. Because again, also I'm driving it so well, mm -hmm. I'm not afraid to hit driver on almost any hole. Um, whereas normally I would be looking for at least like 65 yards. I'll pump driver into 50 right now. Like I don't care. Mm, that's confident. That, that's, ever, that makes huh? golf so much easier when you're hitting driver with that much swag and you get up there. Like it doesn't matter if it's 50, 60, I'm fucking hitting it all day. I'm hitting driver all day. Yeah. So I did the main purpose of mini driver for me was for holes that dog leg right to left. Okay. And so I do have a problem on those right now, but this hybrid that I've got, it's a ping. It's like 16 degrees and mm. it is. It is literally nuclear. It, yeah. yeah, it is so hot. It's ridiculous. I can kind of flare it and carry it like 235 or 40, or I can kind of tee it and play that same draw swing. So again, the reason you can't hit driver both directions is because you can't move the ball position around drive, you know, like driver, you put it in the middle of your stance. we got a problem here, but <laughs> with the mini driver three wood hybrid, you can move the ball back considerably because you still okay. have enough loft. So I can take this hybrid 
and put it literally in the dead center of my stance, like where yeah. a sand wedge would be. And then I just swing normal, but that ball position moves my path out to the right enough that I hit a tight little draw and I can hit that thing to 50 to 60 on a, on a pretty good rope also. And again, considering I'm preparing for champions tour Q school, that's about as far as you need your secondary club to go off the tee. So mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's where I'm at on the mini driver. I do still think it's the amazing play, especially for players with speed. That's what I was going to say. What about like, you know, single digit handicaps they are hitting it 250 to 270, like, you know, kind of a not average golfer, but a little bit better. Do you think that's still a good play for them? I do, because again, I want you to be able to, most players that drive the ball well, not named Bryson DeChambeau, fade it. Um, again, I, I don't want someone who draws it to try to switch to a fade just for this mm -hmm. arbitrary reason, right. but most do fade it. And so taking the mini driver and having it set up to where that's your draw. Mm. And again, I, I don't know if it's the smaller head. I don't know what it is, but most it's a shorter that, shaft too, right? It's a couple of inches, shorter so shaft, 43 and a half inch, like. Yeah, and, and it's weird. You tee it up a, a height you've never teed a golf ball. It's not like yeah, a half inch tee. I was it's, like a, it, it's like a half an inch. So it's kind of the. It looks weird your first twenty times teeing it up uh -huh. that height because you're like. Um, but I do think that most people. Again, I I do think most people because the shorter shaft, the added loft, and it still is a three hundred plus cc head. So mm -hmm. it's still a big forgiving head. Yeah, most it's more forgiving than actually, a three wood. Then you know, because I mean, three woods are hard to hit for a lot of guys. I mean, hundred percent. I mean, then, yeah. again, that's. That's the point is like a three mm -hmm. wood people are like, I'll just get the three and play. Like it's actually harder to hit than a driver, you know, mm -hmm. the modern drivers for sure. Yeah. So having that, that 300 plus CC head allows you to hit it still solid for the most part, having it teed down a little bit and a little shorter shaft. Most people do really do hit it pretty straight. Mm -hmm. Um, so I do think now I got to try one. one. I mean, you've talked about it for years. I love my three wood, but now I'm in the off season. So I, I got to try it. Oh, I mean, you just, you just do it's, it's it's funny how many guys out on tour are definitely tinkering with it. Mm -hmm. And someone will win the Masters soon with one. I mean, there's just so many draw holes that like a draw on two, 10, mm -hmm. 13, depending on the wind and the weather now with the tee boxes. Yeah. Um, but even on a hole like seven, that's super tight. Yeah. I would much rather hit a mini driver on it than a driver. I mean, again, that hole just, gives players fits. I feel like Tiger has never been in that fairway. <laughs> I've seen him hit so many no, shots I mean, on that one. Yeah, it's a it's a tight hole. I mean, it is it's narrow. So we got the driving figured out. Appreciate you walking us through that. I think that's just such a big, big part of the game. I had a really bad year driving more on the technical stuff. Dr. Luke's been helping me out. So appreciate that. But it's just funny how much more confidence you have when you are hitting driver. Well, so hopefully guys can, you know, work on that one thing, maybe try out the mini driver. Um, you talked about irons, obviously uh, a little bit like, Hey, you know, I don't think you, you said you haven't hit a draw in 10 years with a, with an iron. And obviously you're a plus five, you're statistically in the top one of 1%. So with irons, do you ever change trajectory? Is that something you are thinking about? Yes. And so that's, I will say that for the past 10 years, for the most part, no, just because again, for what I have understood on how to do it, it's just a little too painful. I mean, again, my elbows have just not been good. Okay. I guess but, would you and, recommend it for a good player like that yes, isn't in pain? Well, I mean, like yourself, if you didn't have the elbow stuff, this is the other caveat that I'll say though, is, um, I also only play golf when it's nice. Like if it's windy, I'm like, I'm good. <laughs> so it hasn't been a problem for me for a long time. Cause I haven't, yeah. I mean, I play a couple tournaments a year or whatever. Um, but now that I'm finally really trying to play more competitive golf, either to play on the champions tour or when I turn 55 for amateur golf here in just a couple of years, uh, I do need to be able to be prepared for more conditions, mm -hmm. which was honestly the whole reason I was like, I'm going to try to change my swing a little bit. And at the end of the day, yeah. in my body, my swing was just too grooved. It's not changing. But what I did figure out was how to hit it low if I just really have to. So if it's blowing mm -hmm. 10, I'm not going to try to hit it lower or anything. Once mm -hmm. it starts getting up to 10, like 15 to me, historically, doesn't sound that windy. But that's a pretty good wind. I mean, like 15's yeah. moving. I always think of like 20 and change for like British Open stuff. It's like, well, that's howling. And mm -hmm. I know we get more wind than that, whatever. But yes, I do think, but again, that gets back to, I do think that being able to flight your irons is a skill that that is important to play, you know, your best golf. But again, you can do that because you can move ball position around. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, like I'll even... When I move it back, it'll definitely straighten out some of my fade. Yeah. Again, just by changing path. So I'll into the wind, I'll definitely tend to hit more of a straight ball. But again, 
let's say my eight iron right now is 155. My seven iron is probably like 167 or eight. If I'm 150, I mean, I'm trying to, there was one this, there was one yesterday. I couldn't, it was just mind boggling how bad this shot was, but it was a par three, <laughs> like 145. And the wind was kind of three quarter into us off the left. And I honestly, like I just, I, I wanted to punch a seven iron, just like a super flighty little seven iron. But I felt so like, this is just pure ego. Like I felt, it's not that windy, man. I just watched the guy that I played with hit a nine iron and he was, I mean, yeah. if Zalatoris hits two clubs less than me, I don't really care. But like this guy, I'm like, there's no way. And he had just hit, hit it a good shot. And I'm like, there's just no way that's it. And I took an eight iron and just basically hit it what I thought was normal. And it just flared up into the wind. It maybe went 125. That should have been a spot where I'm just taking a ridiculously long club, mm -hmm. again, a seven iron for the shot. And rather than having to get that trapped feeling with lead wrist flexion, just do it by hitting less club mm -hmm. and just really chipping it. And that's. So when you're hitting hard. into the wind and trying to keep it lower, your main thought is just changing ball position and then just kind of getting that uh, follow through a little bit shorter. Or is there anything else you're trying yeah, to Yeah. I mean, like a, Martin Flores used to call it like a shoulder to shoulder shot. So mm -hmm. rather than a full swing, it's definitely more of a punching shot. My, my challenge is again, because of, the elbow issues is my swing is really shallow. Mm -hmm. Again, I just basically pick the ball. And so yeah. when I start like intentionally losing wrist set, mm -hmm. now I'm basically just like, it's like it, my, my swing just becomes a long putting motion. Mm. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. Do you, do you change tempo at all or like timing, you know, a whole when is breezy swing easy? Is that anything you think about? I, I don't think so. I, 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 again, that's, I, I don't really know. I certainly don't go slower. It's, it's not that you're consciously being like, all right, I got to slow this down kind of. Flat. No, no, okay. no, definitely not. And again, one thing I need to work on too, this is just a lack of, I do have just a lack of shots to play. And again, I'm talking about trying to play at the highest level of the highest senior level, tour right? golf. <laughs> yeah. I, I need a few more shots and those shots are going to be choking down. Like once you start choking down on it, you're going to drop trajectory a ton spin mm -hmm. also. And that's just, again, a function of playing more. I mean, I probably hit balls twice a week on average, maybe play three times a month, not in tournaments, maybe. Mm -hmm. And so trying to play more golf to get better at those, you know, non-stock shots would, I mean, again, would be what be, allows me to get to the plus seven that I probably need to. Just a casual plus seven, Scott. No big deal. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what those guys, those guys are good out there. I know it's, it's absolutely insane at all levels. I mean, they're, they're so good. One last thing for course management before we switch to the off season was your thoughts on laying up. When should players lay up? I know decades, super easy with, you know, off the tee, we got 60 yards, we hit driver, we got a driver tree matrix. I love all that. What about laying up with hazards involved, not hazards involved? I get a lot of people kind of pushing back on that. Cause I try and just tell them, Hey, get it as close as you can, unless you can't get over something or it's super narrow do you have any math formula or anything you kind of think about with I mean, that it's just a hundred percent get it as close as you can okay i mean this is what's this is what's interesting is so we always talk about shot patterns and having like a range of outcomes directionally but you also do distance wise so if i put you out there at 260 and you're like my favorite shot is 80 yards all right so we got to move at 180 yards there, you don't just hit it 180 yards. I mean, on the PGA Tour, a 200-yard par three, the shot pattern is going to be 40 or 50 yards deep. So if you're trying to lay it up to 80 specifically, you might do that every so often. I mean, Tiger on approach shots, uh, I, I wish I knew this number better off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure this is pretty close to correct. Tiger got like 42% of his approach shots plus or minus five yards from pin high. Tiger. Yeah. <laughs> so that's if crazy. he was, if he was 260 trying to lay it laid up to 80 yards, he'd get within five yards of that probably about 40% of the time. That's wild. I did. I'd never wild. heard that stat. Yeah. So, I mean, the vast majority of the time you're going to be laying it up into a window of, if we're trying to hit at 80, probably 70 yards. Cause you don't over pure a golf shot. You know, what's funny is I bet you amateurs, if their favorite shot was 80 and they tried to lay it up to 70, they would hit 80 more often than when they try to hit 80. <laughs> I, I would I would guarantee you that's a fact. I agree with you. And so it, it really gets away from, I, I want my favorite shot to, I want to be as close as possible, and I'll probably accidentally have that shot sometimes. But mm -hmm. laying up, again, we want to remove penalties as much as possible. 
But if you can get it on the green ever, like putting, it, it kind of implies the rest of your shot pattern is going to be in pretty good shape mm -hmm. to some extent. As long as there's not too many penalties, you can actually afford a pretty high penalty rate. I mean, a, a pretty high penalty rate by being aggressive. You're going to make more bogeys, yes, but you're also going to make more birdies. And that that's kind of the only situation in golf where you can materially increase your birdies without destroying your overall scoring average. Mm -hmm. And so like if you're, if you're in your wolf game and you're on 18 and you're 250 and like your pure shot carries 240. I mean, again, depending on how much you, you will probably do better financially overall by making more birdies, by getting it up and on and around the green, even if you do hit it in the water 20% of the time. Mm. and just make six and move on so you gotta kind of think about it more like uh, as a season or not just that like that one time because yeah you are gonna have some shots you don't hit well but it's like you gotta kind of play it out a little bit more so you have the, the numbers again, it, yeah. at the end of the day it really is just basic weighted average math i mean yeah because i was gonna say i remember reading a golf.com article and they were talking about that where it was like hey you know guys are like oh, i want to lay up to 80 or 100 yards it's like you just look at your scoring average from 60 versus 80 versus 100 you're going to hit it closer from the closer distance which gives you a better chance of making the putt guys still love to fight me on this and they're like oh, i'm just so much better at 80 than 60 i'm like well work on 60 like I, what, what's the answer here <laughs> and and i doubt they're right i mean again this is the other <laughs> thing too. I, I don't think they have the decade stats to actually back that up usually either no, and this is the thing is like, typically it's like this gut feel of like, I'm better from 100 than I am from 60 because I always hit these bad shots from 60. Typically the bad shot from 60 is the equivalent of like the average shot from 100. Mm. So it's like, yeah, that wasn't a great shot. I get it. But it's still, if we drive, drug you back 40 yards, that would be a pretty good <laughs> shot. Yeah. And that's what I think. And you most can miss the green from 100 pretty easy still. Again, I wish I remembered that number off the top of my head, but I think the pros only hit it like 85% of the time from 80 yeah. from 100 yards. Yeah. I mean, it's insane. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad. I'm glad we got a little more clarity on uh, course management with the driver, with the irons, wind, and uh, laying up. I had a lot of questions about laying up. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Let's transition to the off season because we're unfortunately coming up to that time. It's overseed here in uh, Arizona. All the courses closed, it's still 100 degrees, which sucks. But off season is a great time to uh, you know improve your game. Um, what do you think are something that the average golfer can be doing for the off season? Is it speed training? Is it, you know, hitting indoors? Like what, what would you recommend for players to, uh, to just start to get a little bit better speed training for sure. I mean, there's just no doubt about that. And, and at a minimum doing, you know, hopefully everyone's exercising and everything. And when you get home from exercising at a minimum swinging a club, mm. that's one thing that I've historically like I hate my, my skin sucks. I hate winter golf. Whenever I kind of finished Q school or whatever in October or November, I just put them up until the following March. You know, you I haven't, don't, been, you don't swing a club for months. No, I mean, again, I, I, but again, so I haven't been a member to country club. I just joined this year. I haven't been a member to country club since 2017. Mm -hmm. So I didn't even really have anywhere to go hit balls without just like going to a range or whatever. And so it was just like, I never felt this sunk cost of, well, I'm paying 1400 for the club. I mean, I got to go out there and use it. I just would put the clubs up and I just, so historically though, when I was younger through my forties, I could pick the clubs up and in under two weeks, kind of regain my mobility. I work out a bunch, do yoga. Like I could regain my speed pretty quickly. And this year is the first year where I kind of never really regained it. I would think mm. that I was, in the 172 ball speed last October, November, when I was doing champion Stewart Q school. Yeah. And this year, like, I mean, it's been a, it's, it's been a struggle. I mean, it's definitely been, you're getting the, you get dusting off the ripstick then. Oh, I mean, absolutely. It's sitting right over there in the corner. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's my plan. So your question about off season, I definitely think speed training with, I mean, again, I, I personally like the ripstick because it's 45 inches, the stack's a great one also, but being 42 inches, it just never felt like a driver to me. Couldn't it's really, the, yeah, it's really the only negative I've got to say about the stack. Obviously, you know, I love Sasha, love Marty, blah, 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 blah. But the ripstick design and just the actual length of it just feels right to me. Um, and, and just swinging that thing. Well, Max Grazerman, the guy that kind of ended the season here uh, on, a, on a tear with a couple second place finishes or whatever it was that he did. He I've worked with him since he was in college six seven years ago whatever it was and he told me that what he's been doing to gain some ball speed this year 
was he just does his normal practice session and then he hits 10 drivers as hard as he possibly can with no swing thoughts or concern, like hard as he can. And then just two normal ones at the, at, you know, to finish it. And mm -hmm. that's, he's like, that's been my speed training. And he, he said, he's, I think he's picked up three to five miles an hour of ball speed, which is, which is a ton. And especially when you started at 180, yeah. like <laughs> that's huge. it's a, it's a bunch without doing like specific speed training. But I just think that for, again, protect your back, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. But I just think that speed training will keep you loose and flexible. It is kind of the point of decade also. Like I, I don't hate feeling, feeling salesy, but like most people, when they come back, it takes them kind of a month to dust off their golf brain. Mm -hmm. And so just really thinking about the game a little bit from a scoring standpoint, I want to start this. I, I have not promised it yet, but I, I want to start this. Like Tim Ferriss has this five bullet Friday thing. I want to start working on like a, you know, a, a Monday wisdom or something like that, where I just send out an email to my members once a week with just a three to five minute video. That's just like, Hey, here's an idea. Here's an idea just to kind of keep them thinking about golf and engaged a little bit through the winter time mm -hmm. and then speed training, fitness, everything else is. Yeah. Yeah. How do you uh, recommend people like to go through their stats? I know decade has stats and like, what, what should we be looking for? Is it just like where the red X's are versus the green? Like how, how should we figure out kind of the game plan of what we should be doing if we can practice indoors or when we can kind of get back in for the new season? Well, the one thing that we're finishing up right now, and it, it's actually already released in the app, but we're not drawing people's attention to it just yet. Mm -hmm. I've created a new interface called the Tiger Five interface, and it's it's those five things we talked about earlier. You track penalties; th those five things: penalties off the tee, greens and regulation, obviously your score, and then strokes gained putting. And so, for your putting, you do the initial starting distance, how many putts you took, and then uh, how long or short your first putt was. That's out if, for any putt that's outside of ten feet, and that gives us the speed ratio. And this is where this is going to sound strange coming from a guy who sells a stats portal for a living, but I've been saying this from day one strokes gain driving. It does not work at all period whatsoever for non PGA tour stuff. And the way to explain this is if your home course is Harbor town and mine is Augusta, we can't use the same benchmarks. You're going to be hitting iron off the tee all day. You're still going to be hitting it in the woods. So you're going to look like the shortest crookedest player in history, just generically. I'm going to be hitting driver on every hole. I'm not going to be in the woods very often. And we're using the same benchmarks. There's just, it just can't work that way. Mm. The only reason I ever, and I, I, I did not include strokes gain driving in the app for the first three years that we had it. And then the PAC 12 coaches all demanded it. And I'm like, okay, it doesn't work, but sure. And the more I've thought about it, honestly, strokes gain approach isn't quite as flawed. But like if I'm just playing a normal Muni course and you're playing TPC Sawgrass and we're using the same benchmarks, like that doesn't really work. And so through combinations of if your strokes, excuse me, if your if your penalty rate off the tee is average, your greens and regulation is average, your scoring average isn't very good. Like, hey, and, and we've got your strokes gain putting number. Mm -hmm. I know what your scoring average is and what that probably means your strokes gain putting should be you know, plus or minus a half a shot. And if you're a shot right. and a half outside of that window, Hey, we need to work on our putting. If everything looks good and your scoring average is higher than it should be, you're probably a terrible chipper. If <laughs> you know, so the, through combinations of these data points, I can't tell you specifically what your strokes gain driving is, but nobody can anyways. I get it. Mm. We can post a number, but yeah. it's not accurate, but I can tell you this is probably and the point of like strokes gain. Anything is, this is probably where you're losing value. I can definitely tell you that same thing. And then importantly, we do away with the vast majority of, of, of data entry. I mean, again, it's, it's a really slick interface that, that we designed, which has got five buttons along the top that are for the Tiger 5 mistakes, penalty off the tee, green and regulation, and then the putting stuff, save next hole. And so it's, it's, it's literally, these are my pin sheets from uh, the last two days that I'm going to enter the data in this afternoon just to kind of like, bug it debug it to the last time here but i think it's i think it's pretty much working now that's actually a, a good point too i wanted to ask you about that because i've had some people be like how do i they get a little overwhelmed trying to track all their stats during the during a tournament um or even during a round like is, is there any things you'd recommend they start doing or like what's the easiest way to streamline it because i know there's so much gold in decade yeah i mean that's 
So that's number 12 yesterday. I don't know if it's yesterday the first yep, day. Yep, that looks first perfect. Day. Yep. Um, they're number 13, rather. And what I can tell you that means is I had 229s, a par five. I hit the fairway. I hit the green. I had a 20-yard chip shot. I came up just short and had a 20-yard chip shot. Uh, oh, God, this one was actually brutal. <laughs> I've been chipping the ball so good, it's ridiculous. And this was a very straightforward chip. I needed to carry it nine yards, and then it had 11 yards to roll to the pin. Like, it was so straightforward. And I, I landed it in the ball mark I was looking at. And so it just literally just hit and stopped, like, uh. two feet away. And I'm like, I mean, again, that's, that was brutal. So... I had a 27 foot birdie putt okay. that I yep, hit see it. five inches long. So that five with the arrow, with the line next to it, if I had hit it five inches short, the line would be on the other side of it. Okay. <clears throat> so that's how I track it. I mean, so again, I had this dot fairway, that dot green. Whenever mm-hmm. I have a chip shot, I put it in the bottom end, but I put a Y next to it. So I remember. Mm-hmm. And then so I can just go through and then you just enter it all super quick like that. Okay. So, so you just have it written down and then, yeah, I always tell everyone to do it right after the day if you can, just cause you can kind of, if it's a multi-day event, you can kind of get a little closure for the round and you can, uh, you know, not get the days mixed up. I also <laughs> feel like it's a nice closing ritual for me. It's like, all right, that day's over. It's like time to go into the next one. Do you ever recommend people like if you have a historically awful round just to be like, I'm scrapping this one. Oh, for sure. If you just, yeah. If you just, I mean, sometimes just like, I'm good. I don't want to relive that (laughs) whatsoever. But what I do tell people, and this is again, why I'm trying to design this interface to focus on the Tiger five. What I tell the tour players that I work with is I want you to finish your round, do whatever you want to do. But at some point right after or that evening, Mm -hmm. you know, we've got shot link, but I don't need you guys to enter your stats in the portal. But what I do want you to do is sit down. I'm a big meditation guy. Do a 10 minute meditation to get your brain chill And then go through the Tiger five mistakes that you had that day and think, is there anything I could have done differently? Like maybe it's just bad golf, you know, whatever. But like, was there something you did wrong on this nine iron from 145 where you were trying to shape it to the hole against your, Mm -hmm. then you smothered it? Or was there something (laughs) that you could have done differently? And this is, again, I play a smart guy on the internet, but I just really actually think I'm a complete idiot who somehow backed into this. I'm definitely a complete idiot when it comes to golf prior to decade. And I used to think, you know, when we would go, me and my buddies go out for dinner and talk about all the dumb stuff we did that day. Looking back at it, I'm like, how did I not start thinking about what could I do different? And I think that at the end of the day, I felt like, well, I'll I'll stop doing those stupid mistakes when I get better. Mm -hmm. Not there's maybe some better decisions I could make. And that's the different tigers, the goat tiger sat down was like, you know, I'm getting kind of sick of wasting shots every day. What is it that I'm specifically like the, when I sit down and feel like I should have shot lower, why? And just write down everything, you know, every reason. And if one of those reasons, like, well, I, I made bogey with that seven iron from 175, like, well, you're kidding yourself. Cause that's going to happen. <laughs> but it's like these five recurring things kept yeah. coming up for him and just like, okay, I'm going to go out and try to just not do those. And I, again, I hate saying this, but like at the end of the day, I'm just out there trying to avoid those five mistakes mm-hmm. and trust that there's going to be some good, there's going to be some birdies and whatever. And and I hate saying that your, your birdies and Eagles and everything are just kind of luck. But at the end of the day, yesterday, I, I, I Eagled number 13. I hit a good drive out there, had 195. And the, the, the side of this green, this is actually the green right here. The side of the green, it's only, I got to get some glasses. One, two, it's, it's <laughs> damn it. Here we go. Aging yourself over here, Scott, hitting I'm your night, hitting you. your pitching wedge 115, having to get your go. glasses out. <laughs> it's only 20 deep right, right there. If it focuses, please. Yep. Yep. It's only 20 deep, but it's also in this front part is only five yards wide. Right. So like it's a <clears throat> it's a really narrow, small area. And I hit a six iron just right at it. And when we were pulling it, like it's, it's kind of blind. But when we were going up there, I grabbed my putter and my lob wedge and my 54 degree because I did not think there was any chance downwind 10 firm, fast greens. I didn't think there was any chance it was going to actually stay on the green. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, I started just to hit a five iron because I thought chipping back into the wind would be easier. Yeah. And then I was like, you know what? This is like if it's a perfect club, 
if I catch it all and everything. And so when I get up there, it had perfectly landed into this little hill, bounced up and was 10 feet past the hole. Like I literally thought if you'd said for your life, is that ball putting or not? I would have for sure said not putting. And we get up there and because of how, whatever nice little, you know, bite that it took probably landed into the grain, into a little uphill. It actually stopped within probably 12 yards of its pitch mark. That's kind of lucky, you know, mm. and I got up there and made the putt for Eagle. That's what I'm trying to illustrate to people is that's again, I'm not saying it's luck. I had to hit a great shot, Yeah, but it's also pretty convenient where it wound up. The wind right. had to be just right. If it's three miles an hour or more or less, the ball doesn't land in the exact same spot. Those great shots and great outcomes all require luck, but we can avoid the the easy pedantic mistakes by just thinking better. Do you feel like, I know you've made a million Eagles in your life, but the everyday golfer, you know, they get some birdie putts or they stuff one, or maybe they do have a look at Eagle. I know you talk about not trying to make putts. So when you had that, all of a sudden you're like, Oh, I have an Eagle putt now. Does any part of you still just be like, Oh, I want to make this. Like what, what does that process sure. look like for you? You, so you still have it, but you just say, what does that process look like when you do get that thought? Well, again, the, the stop trying to make putts is kind of tongue in cheek, but it's like this putt. This By the putt way, specific. it works though. When I, when I post that on social media, people love to fight me on that. And I'm like, no, it's oh. about, you're about doing the process. <laughs> yeah. Well, and again, Cam Smith, probably the best putter on the planet right now. I've got a great clip on my, on my Instagram of him. He's in his backyard talking about putting. He's, I, like, I've seen he's that. like, I'm not trying to make putts. I'm just trying to put a good read on it put a good start line on it, put a good speed on it. And after mm -hmm. that, it's out of my control. Like, so yeah. I'm just trying to do everything I can. And if the ball goes in, it is kind of like, I mean, at the end of the day, a 10 foot putt on tour is 40%. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not a very long putt. So for me, not putting very well this year, that putt was probably 32 or 35%. Like, and are you I, thinking about that at all? Like you're like, oh, I, I am because I'm trying to be realistic with my expectations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, yeah, I do. I mean, back when I caddied for Zell Torres, when he won the Texas Am and U.S. Junior, he didn't hit a single shot with me telling him exactly what his expectation is because mm -hmm. it's often way higher than you expect. And so I just understanding that is huge. I would just love for like a, like to, to do some sort of study where you go out with players and you are telling them that every time. Cause I had Charlie Belgian on who's won on the PGA tour a couple of times and um, he was on the show and he was talking about when he was playing on the tour, his caddy would literally tell him that on every single shot. Every single shot. And that's so cool. I mean, these guys are, you know, he's comparing his, the PGA tour average. I mean, he's on the PGA tour, but he just talked about how it made such a big difference in resetting those expectations because the biggest mistake I realized I made before I started this brand and, and learning about you and your uh, decade was just like my expectations were out of this world. Like, what are you doing? You're never going to perform as well as you think based on these highlight reels that we see on TV. Well, and that's what people, one of the main things I get pushback wise, I'm going to find this stat over here. Real quick. One of the main things I get pushback wise is simply people saying, I don't want to be average, like a tour player. Well, I'm not looking to be average. It's like, okay, so strokes gain total. <laughs> Scotty Scheffler, 2.5 strokes this year. Um, 15th place, damn. 15th place was 0.97, Maverick McNeely. I can't believe Maverick was that high, honestly. I don't realize, didn't realize he had that good of a season. Um, if I take your, your average score on a hole and, and I lower it against the expectation by 0 0.05, we do that 18 times, that's 0.9 shots. That's literally like saying... I don't want to be average. If you can beat the average by 0. 0.5 hundredths of a shot on a hole, you're top 20 in the world. Like it's such a, it's such a fine line. And so when I tell someone like it's 2.8 from a hundred yards, I don't want to be average. Like, okay, let's call it 2.77. Is that that big of a difference? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just not, it's not material. It is material because it adds up over 18 holes, but it is not material on any given shot. And, and the key, again, getting back to the idea that our, our score is far more determined by our bad shots than our good shots. I mean, you just rarely hole out from the fairway. And that's kind of the only way to really gain over a shot. Otherwise, mm -hmm. even if you hit it to an inch, so if we start in the fairway at 100 yards, average score is 2.8. I hit it to an inch. I still have to tap in. So I made a two where I should average 2.8. You gain picked up 0.8 shots. 
you can lose 0.8 shots in a hurry on a golf shot on any shot. Yep. And that's the key is like, we just can't have these massive mistakes. And that means we got to, again, unfortunately play pretty, what most people would consider conservative. We just got to make good decisions, hit good shots, avoid the really like for a tour player, losing a half a shot on a shot and higher. Those are the ones you really have got to a- a- avoid and eliminate. And aside from that, it's just about farting along and <laughs> seeing what you shoot. I mean, again, it's going back to shooting 65 with, with Garrett in that good, good video. Obviously I'm about to hit play golf in front of a million people. Obviously I want to play well at some point along the way. I'm like, it's going well. Like I was, I think five under through 10, something like that. And had already like left a shot or two out there on, on a par five, like, but it's, it's going well. And it's so easy to start playing the mind game. Like, well, I've got two reachable par fives coming up. I've got a drivable par four. Like, man, what could I get this to? And it's like, well, that same reachable par five has also got water all the way along the left-hand side, native area all along the right. You can make seven on that hole in a hurry. Mm. And again, this is where just checking out of expectation management and attachment to outcome. um, That's just everything. It it really is everything in my opinion. Again, I'm saying this as a 51 year old who was the biggest lunatic in professional golf 30 years ago, like undoubtedly like, and now you're doing back yoga. At it, I mean, I would love to, you know, look at this guy <laughs> meditation. Looking back, at it, I mean, <laughs> looking back at it, it's comical to me that I thought this was a, a recipe for success. I mean, it's just embarrassing <laughs> to be perfectly honest, but through, I would say 10 legitimate years of trying to become a better person, um, meditation, just, I've been through a lot of crazy shit in life and gives you a little bit of perspective to realize, Oh, this is just not that big of a deal. Mm. I do wonder if I could go back to my 20 year old self and explain these things. If I would listen to even myself or take Mm. myself serious. Right. Um, But it's like, man, you can keep beating your head into the wall, but it's not working. Why don't you, why don't you take a left here and see how this path goes? (laughs) So I'd say the big three I got from off season was speed training, learn decade slash look at your stats and meditation. I feel like if, if those three, and you know, obviously some sort of swinging, if you can I feel like if you do that, you're already ahead of most golfers. I mean, a hundred percent. I mean, again, that's, and I would put meditation at, at probably at the top of the list mm-hmm. because again, it really is about having a little bit more fun out on the course because you're not just tied in knots the whole time we're all running these iterations of mental gymnastics all day long of, well, if this happens, then this and this, that, and the other, it's like, you don't have a clue what's going to happen. So just hit the next shot. And again, that, that's as cliche as you get, but it really is correct. And again, that's where I, I feel like I didn't understand when sports psychologists would say, you know, you have to remain present. Like no one ever explained to me what that means. And what that means is not being mad about what you've already done. That's not the present moment. And it's not thinking about results and what the cut line is or anything else, because that's in the future thinking the next shot really is all that matters. And again, I I just, I I know I talk about my own game a bunch, but it's like, well, I'm, I'm kind of a living lab for what I teach. And it's like, when I shot that 83, I didn't get mad because I was like, this isn't going well at all today. I made my first 10 in competition in 28 years and shot 83. Like, wow, that was unbelievable. And just moved on. And that can be done. It's really, really difficult, but it can be done. And in the end, the flip side of that is when it's going well, you also just try to stay as you know relaxed as you possibly can and commit to the next shot, pick a good target hit it, find it and, and hit it again. I mean, again, it's, it's cliche, but it is correct. And it, and it can be done. I think that's what I needed someone to tell me it can be done. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you got to just do it once or twice. And you're like, wow, that really works. You know? And it's like, you think back to all the rounds where you were playing mental gymnastics and how it just never worked probably, or very rarely. Well, I mean, and there's times when I do wonder, like, I feel like I've, I don't, I certainly don't think I'm uh, enlightened or have meditated myself into being a monk. But there are definitely times, not only on the golf course, but in my personal life where I'm like, I should be a lot more mad about this than I am. Like, and I I really like kind of dig into the thought of like, I can't believe I'm not fuming right now. (laughs) I mean, just, but I'm just not. I mean, again, like I still get mad. I still get high and low and everything else, but like I can drop it 
typically almost immediately Mm -hmm. and and just kind of laugh about it and again that's if you get the waking up app from sam harris that's that's to me the the meditation app to use and so you'll hear me just basically quote him for the rest of uh the time that you're a decade member but the one thing that he said that really hits home for me is you have to start to recognize a thought as a thought it's nothing more than that and importantly i thought meditation whenever i was younger and trying to do it was all about having no thoughts and that's not it at all it's about recognizing thought patterns as just nothing more than thoughts before you ruminate on them for 30 minutes. Because I used to always want to say like, I would do whatever stupid stuff and then be like, Oh, if I could go back 30 minutes, I would do that differently. And it's like, no, you wouldn't. You would make the same mistake a million times in a row until you learn a new skill. And it's like that skill is again, meditation for it, it just it just is and i think that it, it i used to be kind of nervous talking about it because it sounds so woo wooey and and like bse but now that you can see tiger mj lebron kobe pete jackson phil i mean just all these great coaches that's what they're talking about when they say presence and process and all these other things that's whether you want to call it meditation explicitly or not that's what it is like the well, zone, the zone yeah. used to be this accident where you yeah. just like, I mean, again, the first golf tournament I ever won, I've told this story a bunch, but it's, it's so funny. I can't help but tell it. My, my girlfriend in 10th grade had broken up with me the weekend before I was all <laughs> sad. And I walked around this JV golf tournament with my Walkman listening to every rose has a thorn by, <laughs> by poison. I've never heard this. <laughs> Swear to God, I listened to it on a loop the entire day, just sad, carrying my little golf bag around, shot <laughs> 70 and won this tournament. And I didn't even think about it. I wasn't thinking about golf at all the entire day. I was thinking about how sad I am. And I was playing this slow, just chill song at the end of the day. I still laugh every time I hear it on the radio. I just laugh my <laughs> ass off about this. But it's like that I accidentally was meditating or at mm -hmm. least had the inner rhythm of a meditation. I just didn't care what I shot. I was too sad. I was just, just, I was just that, a sad little 10th grader. <laughs> that's a great that's a great visual right there to think about because it was a uh, was it a Walkman or was that a is a tape player? What was that? It was a, it was a Walkman tape player. Absolutely. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> oh man, you got time for I didn't even flip the tape over to go to the other side. Just, you just finish it, just rewind the tape back and let's go again. <laughs> I love it. You got time for a few so more ridiculous. tournament questions or that food coma setting in? What's that? Oh, I'm I doing said, good. Okay, perfect. I just had a, a couple more questions on tournaments because we were kind of going down that road. Obviously, your sophomore year story, it's going to be tough to beat that one. Uh, but I know you have uh, some tournaments coming up. What is uh, your prep looking like for Q School? You know, I'm, I'm hoping I've really kept my calendar as clean as I can for the next six weeks leading into it. So my goal is to play three times a week. That was what I did wrong. Last, well, I didn't do wrong last year. I just didn't have an option. I tore a muscle in my calf last year in July. Didn't touch my clubs in August, September, October. I played eight times in November leading into Q school. Missed by one uh, from getting to final stage. So my plan this year is I, I've really got some work to do in my putting. I, I really need to get out there, do the speed drills from the Decade app, especially from Maverick McNeely's modification up from five to 15 feet, because that's where you really can separate yourself is that, you know, hopefully we're just not three putting very often from outside 25 feet. And then you really want to be making your share of five to 15 foot putts. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to really grind on that. And this is what's honestly crazy. I'm going to try to not hit that many balls. And th this is going to be weird sounding, but the more balls I hit, the more I start thinking about my swing and kind of tinkering. And like, I, I just, the last two days I've hit the ball. Great. I mean, I putted terrible. I shot one under on my own ball on a, on a difficult golf course. Um, and I didn't, I hadn't touched my clubs in 10 days and I just spent four days in Vegas from, uh, Thursday through Sunday. And just the more I hit balls and think about, I need to hit balls to stay loose, mm -hmm. but I don't need to hit balls to try to work on anything. Yeah. And so I am hoping that I take the majority of my practice time and really put it on, the putting green and uh, you know, I probably need to be personally a little bit more diligent with my meditation practice. I, I do it a couple times a week. I probably need to get it to where I'm just doing it every day. Uh, that certainly would be ideal. It's just, sometimes it's just hard to force yourself to take the time to do it. So that's, that's yeah. going to be it. And getting in the gym 
much more consistently. My, my, my legs are definitely, I've had this little thing going on with my left patella tendon that uh, has kind of kept me out of it, but I need to get in there and do that. I'm not going to speed train, okay. although I want to. I just think that I'm, I'm, my body's like, I'm, I'm kind of riding this line right now yep. where I could hurt myself uh-huh. So to try to gain three more miles an hour of ball speed. You know what I realistically could do. It's just not worth it. So, yeah, I guess I should have started for those that people that don't follow you yet, or maybe don't know what is your kind of goal with going to Q school and these like tournaments is your goal to just, you know, are you trying to get on the senior tour? Or do you just want to like test your game? Cause you went to Q school, um, the normal one back when we first did our interview, you had just finished, you were wearing Crocs for that one. And I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. you had uh, you had that whole story and then you went last year. So this is your second attempt at the senior, correct? Second attempt at seniors. I don't know, man. I mean, again, if you gave me a champions tour card right now, I'd be thrilled, but I'd also be like, Oh no, like <laughs> my life is a little too chaotic. I've got 11 and 15 year old girls, a wife and ex-wife, two companies to run. Like, do I really have the time to put into it? And, and the only reason I say that is playing golf through retirement into my mid sixties is really like, I'm just a better human when I'm playing competitive golf. And so senior amateur golf starting here and now only four years for me, like that sounds pretty fun. Mm-hmm. I mean, and that's something I can do until my mid sixties. Let's be realistic. If I did get a champions tour card, I mean, I'm probably not going to have some eight year just, I'm not going to probably be Stephen Alker and just out there crushing everyone. I'm probably going to be fighting. Man, for that. there would be a Cinderella story if you did. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, you know, again, and this is what's funny is like, I definitely think that I could, if I had the time and life skills of organization that I, I, I think I could, I just don't think it's realistic for everything to fall into place for me that needs to, to really be that good. And so realistically, you know, if there were a corn fairy tour for the champions, I'd probably be the guy bouncing kind of back and forth on an annual basis. And, you know, while it'd be nice to make a couple hundred grand extra, I don't really need it. So that doesn't really excite me about it. I mean, realistically, it would be fun, but I don't really care. So it's really just going to to test your game at the highest level. Yeah. I mean, well, again, I just, I feel like I should try. And, you know, playing in the senior U.S. Open this year was amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I think I can make a U.S. Mid-Am or two through my 50s. The only thing that I struggle with is just really sitting down and planning out and saying, I'm going to go play in these six events, mm-hmm. um, which, I you know, that would be something that would make a lot of sense for me to try to, to get into doing more of. I just, just it's just honestly, my, my life has been so disorganized for six years it's kind of comical so well luckily in that or uh, disorganization period you've helped grow the game and decade and made people wicked smart so we appreciate you uh putting your game on the back burner every once in a while because it, it's definitely helped so you have a obviously a scheduling you know that's kind of part of it and then you know not hitting too many golf balls working on the putting um working on the meditating side of things when you do get into the week of this event like what do you start doing do you are you super regimented i know you have a family you got companies you got all this like what does that tournament prep look like for you the week of or even you know after the round <clears throat> uh you know i will definitely just shut everything down for that week so i'll it's in gulfport mississippi so i'll fly out there sunday morning i'll play nine holes it, it just looks like a place I went last year was a little bit of, it wasn't a good course for me. It was a little bit kind of a smaller, like just kind of, it wasn't a great course for me. This one looks like what you would expect a Mississippi resort course, just mm. pine trees, but plenty looks like plenty of width. So I don't think it'll take me much to, to learn the golf course. Uh, I'll, I'll play nine holes on Sunday, probably drive the other nine that day, mm-hmm. play 18 on Monday depending on if I can get out there and play 18 on Sunday, that's what I would like to do. I don't remember what time my flight lands Um, play 18 Sunday. And then just whichever nine is a little trickier on Monday, Mm -hmm. but the actual tournament week, I mean, I might do a putting speed drill after a round or two, but I definitely am a a pretty big believer of like, you're not going to change your game much, man. I mean, again, (laughs) I'm expecting to be hitting the ball. Well, yeah. And so like the idea of just sitting out there is though I'm going to find something <laughs> if I'm not is unlikely. And so getting your rest, I mean, that's the one thing like with Zalatoris and these guys, 
they've really got these majors dialed in where they've played their practice round the week or two before Mm -hmm. they're going out there and just playing nine holes each day. They're doing some practicing and then they're getting out of there. You know, when I played in the 99 us open at Pinehurst, just a Hooters tour player. Like it was just the coolest experience ever. I spent like 12 hours a day at the course, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, <laughs> probably exhausted. Yeah. I mean, by the time Thursday got there, it's like, man, pace yourself a little bit. Like, yeah. <laughs> and that's one thing that is, I learned that when I made it to final stage of Q school in 2008 for the first time, I'm going out, there's a 35 year old amateur made it to final stage of PJ tour Q school. And it's two practice rounds and then six rounds. Like you're out there for a long time. Yeah, that old practice schedule was six days. That's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, it was so long. It's just, it is just Groundhog Day. And so (laughs) going to movies every single day, like forcing yourself to not just sit around in a a dust mite ridden hotel room is just so critical. Do you, uh, I'm curious too, like, do you struggle or do you, I know you've played obviously I don't even know how many years of professional and amateur events. So you're no stranger to it, but I get a lot of people reaching out, you know, worried about the people they play with. Some of them are assholes. Some of them don't talk. Some of them talk too much. What's your strategy to deal with different kinds of personalities you get in tournaments? Man, that's a tough one. Cause I really, I'm probably kind of the, the quieter guy. I, I just, you're also kind of a celeb though. I mean, you've got to get paired up with people that are like, Hey man, I'm in your program. No, I mean, again, that, that is a weird, it, it is a weird um, thing. Like I, I, I've i told my daughter, I took my daughters to Six Flags up in Chicago last year and, and a couple different people like actually recognize me. I'm wearing a, a decade hat and had people come out and they're just like, what is going on here? And I'm like, I'm famous in the <laughs> smallest subset of the human population. You can get elite golfers. Um, and so it is a little weird when I'm paired with someone who knows who I am as a member or whatever. Uh, It's honestly one of the reasons I don't do playing lessons for the most part, even with junior golfers, because they just get a little too freaked out and they're more worried about their swing and wanting to, to hit the ball. Well, and I'm like, I don't care. I don't teach mechanics. I assume you're good. I don't really care if you are or aren't. I just, let's just talk golf. And it, it is actually why the indoor seminar that I created, I, I do believe it's the best way to teach golf, like course management, because mm-hmm. we're indoors. We've got a drone, we've got Google satellites. Like I can do everything we need to out on the golf course, but just do it inside. And to where we were not having to worry about your golf swing. And another thing that's not good is like, let's pretend we've got a shot with, you know, pins five yards from the left. I give you a target five yards right of that. And you hit it five yards right of that. So mm-hmm. now we're 30 feet from the hole and you three putt it and you're like blaming strategy. And it's like, no, that was just variance. If you'd yeah. happen to pull that shot five yards instead of push it five yards, you'd had a two footer for birdie. Like it's just not, it's not how it works. So I know that wasn't remotely close to your question of. Oh no, I'm just, I'm just always curious. Cause I mean, I've been paired with some, <laughs> I got paired up with a guy earlier this year, top five psychos all time. I mean, he called himself, I can't even say what he said to him he called himself a horrible name we'll just say that on every hole he almost Mm. won the event he got into a playoff and and somehow lost which karma probably got him there but i mean this guy was legitimately calling himself the worst things you can say while i'm getting ready to putt still like i mean this guy i know this is like an extreme example but i just didn't know if you've ever had any of those i know you're probably not going to get that That would have been me 25 years ago (laughs) i mean literally like i was awful now I've just really, I just laugh at it now. If someone's yeah. acting Oh, like I that, laugh at it, but I mean, I'm like, like, this guy's got 14 weapons. I mean, this guy was like one one uh, card de- uh, short of the deck. So I was a little little weird, but I mean, I just didn't know if you, you pretty much have your game plan. You know who you are at this point in your life. You know your golf yeah. game. You just kind of go out and play it. Yeah, I mean, there was a time, I mean, again, I can't remember what year this was. It was just within the last couple of years. I hadn't really played that many golf tournaments or whatever, and and I was this, it was, when was it? It was, it was the Texas amateur, but I'm on the tee. Like it's right by the putting green and you know, it's the state am. So there's mainly college kids. And I could tell when I went up to tee off, like the whole putting green stopped to watch. <laughs> and so it is a little, it's a little weird, but also yeah, like, it just is what it is. Like, this is the, the hard part about it is like, there's a decent chance I don't hit a good shot. And it's like, Oh, I thought this guy could play. And it's like, well, that was one shot. Let's see what our score is at the end of the round. Mm-hmm. Like that's yeah. what's so hard about it is you just also, you just got to not care. I mean, again, there was a part of me 
especially at the senior U.S. Open this year where, I mean, I was hitting it so bad on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. I was just like, I don't want to shoot 81, 81. Like that was, yeah. that was in my brain. Like this is a real <laughs> golf course, real slopey, fast greens. If the wheels come off, like it could get ugly fast. <laughs> and at the end of the day though, like if, if I had a buddy that got into it and did that, I wouldn't think, Oh, what is this? Oh, this guy's an asshole. He can't break 80 in the senior US open. Yeah. And anyone who does think that isn't your friend. So mm. fuck them. I mean, again, I, I hate saying it that way, but it's like, if someone's taking joy in you not doing well, and again, this is something you really have to recognize because it's easy. Like I argue with enough people on, on social media, the no laying up guys and whoever else that I don't want to go shoot 81 and have Tron be able to post a screenshot of my 81 and make fun of me. Like, but also at the end of the day, what do I care? Like, okay. Yeah, we're all going to be dead one day. It really doesn't matter. Yeah, like, I don't really <laughs> care anymore. And again, <laughs> it's easy to say and hard to do, but that gets back yeah. to, meditation and recognizing those are just thoughts like that you don't have to give them any power and again mm -hmm. i know that sounds super cheesy but if you take up a practice and you do it consistently you'll start to see that and this is what's hard is i was trying to explain this to a tour player the other day who i was trying to talk into doing it and he was definitely like i don't know about that and i'm like here's the point is if i put you on a diet you need to lose 50 pounds and you did everything perfect for six months but you didn't lose a single pound but you got to keep doing it and then on day one of month se seven you're just going to wake up 50 pounds lighter like it would be really hard to stick with that and just trust and that's the thing about meditation is it's going to feel really stupid for a long time mm -hmm. it's going to feel totally pointless for a long time and then all of a sudden one day you're gonna be in a situation and you're gonna be like i should be a lot more mad about this than i am or i should be whatever it is and i'm just not mm-hmm and that's the point. But again, you're literally, again, Sam Harris talks about the point of a meditation routine is you're practicing for the best day of your, you're preparing for the worst day of your life. It's coming. I mean, again, not to get into it, but like I had a double murder suicide in my family with my sister and two nephews eight years ago. And luckily I had at least started the process to where I was able to recognize, but like I could have made a ton of mistakes that could have just literally ruined my life over about a six month period. Mm -hmm. But I was able to at least be like, well, that's a bad idea. Let's take a second before we think about that and just other stuff. Now, do I still make mistakes? Absolutely. But yeah. I'm also able to compartmentalize them and, and like forgive yourself before you just beat yourself. Like that guy you're talking about beating himself up. That's a show. I mean, again, as someone who used to do that. Yeah. It's a show for everyone else to let them know. Like if you're playing bad, you're trying to let everyone know I'm better than this. Yeah. I really believe that. I know that's why I was doing it. I, I want everyone there. that's watching it. Nobody cared. Yeah. And everyone and anyone who did care was hoping you it's played It's like you're trying worse. to save your ego a little bit. 100%. And I would say that that guy that was acting like an ass while almost winning the tournament Ugh. is just an arrogant narcissistic asshole i would mm. guarantee you that oh I, I played with him both days and i would 100 percent agree with you it's just yeah. funny though i mean i hear it from 30 40 50 even 60 year old guys that are like man i really want to get in a tournament but i'm just so worried about what this person's going to think at my club or my brother-in-law or this person i'm like you're in your 50s like just it's hard to tell them to stop caring but i mean that's just all it is it's crazy well but that's that's the point though is Saying not stop caring is, is a not, okay, what does that mean? Right. And that means learning how to meditate because again, straight Sam Harris, you have to recognize a thought as a thought. And, and again, it, it's something that finally clicked with me actually not too long ago. I was listening to this one video on YouTube from him and he's talking about like one of the meditations is to just close your eyes and listen for a sound. So like right now I've got a pool being built. I can kind of hear the guys out there hammering something. But I didn't know that sound was going to come into my head. And I'm also capable of being like, just right back to conversation. Mm -hmm. That's what a thought is. It just, it's, it's a sound that just comes into your head. You, you don't know what the next thought you're going to think is until it just appears. I mean, and this is where it starts getting like a little woo wooey, but it's like, it's the truth where Sam talks yeah. about, you're not the thinker of your thoughts. You're, you're not, they just randomly jump in your head and you can give them power or not. And again, it sounds super new agey but it's it is just the truth um if only we learning... got an instruction manual on how to use this thing when we were growing up oh my god i could use an instruction manual <laughs> on how to raise kids 
<laughs> but it's just hard, man. I mean, it's it, just hard. And that's why not that many people live that fulfilling of lives. I mean, that's just the truth, unfortunately. And it's because way too many people give their thoughts that aren't really their fault too much credit. I mean, again, now I'm over quoting Sam here, but he's got this deal. Like if, if, if someone just came in your front door and <laughs> followed you around narrating to you what you're saying to yourself, you would shoot them in under 30 minutes. Yep. You'd be like, what are you doing to me? Like, leave me alone. But we're all sitting here having this conversation. And it's just funny. Cause he's like, you know, the, the only difference between you and a schizophrenic is the fact that you have enough sense to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> like we're all thinking it <laughs> just, you know, to keep your mouth shut, the schizophrenic sits over there and says it all out loud. Like that's the only difference. So when you're in these big tournaments and you know, there's a certain number and you're, you know, you hit a bad shot or you're just not hitting it well that day, old you used to just get super mad. I remember last interview you talked about breaking a, that gap wedge needed to get broken anyways. You, you've, you know, you're not perfect, right? So when you do have a really bad shot or you're just, you know, make a double on a par five or something stupid like that, you're, you're, you're much better now about just being able to kind of separate from that instead of letting it impact the next shot and the next shot. Yes. hundred percent. I mean, and again, it, and this is where, so my, my playing partner this week, he hit it to like 10 feet on a par three on like the third hole of the day. He, he bogeyed like the first couple holes, he hits it to like 10 feet and he misses it and he kind of hits his thigh and he walks off and he's muttering. And I'm like, dude, you're, it's, you're like 30% on that putt. <laughs> he's like, I know, but I just wanted to make it. I'm like, I get it. Obviously you wanted to make it, but the problem is you've now primed yourself to be getting a little emotional. Now we're walking up to a really hard hole. Mm -hmm. And if you happen to hit a bad tee shot here, you've started the downward spiral and you started the downward spiral with a shot where you're like, it was a 30% chance you make it. And you didn't, yeah. hit, you didn't hit a bad putt. It just didn't yeah. go in. It wasn't like you missed a three footer. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and so now you've started this downward spiral from something that just was a non-event. Mm. And that's what we're trying to avoid because again, that's where you go make a, a double on the next one. And not every time, but like, it's going to happen some, mm -hmm. and now you've just primed yourself to completely implode. And that's really, I would love to see like a heart rate monitor, a blood pressure monitor on myself. Cause I'm, I, the, the shot you're talking about was a USAM qualifier where I was right on the bubble um, with like five holes to go. I probably had to play, I think like one under coming in to make it, it, it after the fact. And I kind of knew that's the number or whatever. And on a 230 yard par three, my trail foot slips. I almost fall down. I hit this three iron 50 yards left, completely dead behind this tree. I, I certainly don't need to make double. And I felt like, again, at the time I was like, I, I really kind of need to take a little risk here. And so I tried to go under this tree and it just caught the tree and I just curled this gap wedge all the way over the tree and over the green and Sounds like a good club throw, though. It was a great club throw. But it was one of those things, like, I when you said I needed to break it, like, I hated that gap wedge. Yeah. I literally hated that gap wedge and had it in my bag the whole year. And I finally <laughs> was like, I am breaking the son of a bitch right here to force me to get another one. And, again, I'm not excusing my uh, club toss because of it, but that literally was my thought process. I'm either breaking this thing over my knee or I'm hurling it. And, but, but, but. I was right back to calm by the time I hit my next shot. That's impressive uh, to go from Chernobyl like that to chill. That's a, uh... well also like, again, it was just like, I, I did just snap. And then it's also a little bit of self-awareness. was just laughing like, okay, yeah. that was completely ridiculous. <laughs> um, yeah. Not oh idea. man. Too good. Too good. Uh, before getting into the last question, uh, you know, I appreciate you sharing so much over the last few interviews. Uh, everybody loves your stuff. So thanks again for, for coming back. Um, what's the best place for people to follow you, learn more about decade uh, so they can learn more. I've, I know we've already had so many people already joined, but uh, in case we're getting new listeners, uh, what's the best spot to follow you? Uh, decade.golf at this point, we, we finally are trying to grow up as a company. There's some, there's some other good stats portals out there. Like I, I have nothing bad to say about clipped or, you know, whoever I do have bad stuff to say about Arcos. I don't think that tracking your shots the way they do in the data they provide, I don't think that has any value whatsoever, but aside from there's some good products out there. What we try to do first and foremost is teach you course management strategy, the mindset. Again, as you can see the flags behind me, this thing has been uh, well-received across all tours, all everything. 
So it really is the, about trying to teach you how to find those pedantic shots because those get pedantic mistakes. Those get lost in strokes gained. It mm -hmm. might move your strokes gain number 0 0.02 shots or something over the course of how many rounds, but really focusing in on these tiger five mistakes. And then what, what is your discount code? Is it wicked smart? Yep. Wicked smart. <clears throat> yeah. If you go to decade.golf, I think you click buy now and then you put in your, your code. It's, I think it's 30% off. Is that right? I think it's 20%. Yep. 20% off. 20% off. It's, I mean, again, I hate saying it because it's my product, but I, I really do believe it's the best product in golf. I, I really, really believe that too, for shooting lower scores, getting less frustrated and everything else. And then the main thing is I've tried to build, you know, I'm a big Tony Robbins fan. And he says, you know, his, one of his big things is, is under promise and over deliver. And throughout, you know, the first seven years of having this app, eight years, we've just kept on building and adding more features into it. And now with our driving targets feature, which allows you to do satellite overlays while you're out there playing um, and, and your shot patterns to help you manage the course in real time. But then also if you play tournaments or anything like that, there's free yardage books in the app. So at the end of the day, the app really pays for itself. If you, if you play any tournaments at all, the app is basically free. I mean, I'm a huge fan of it. Obviously, I talk about it in like half the episodes or more of 300 plus. So it's helped my yeah. game. And like we talked about on the first one, I'm like, what the hell was I doing before decade? <laughs> like, how did I pick targets? I would have loved to be able to transport back. I went to Q school in 2019. I have no idea how I picked targets. Like literally no idea. I would I would love to know. So decade, well, that's it's the just whole part of my it's... life now. Like I just I go out and I go out, pins five from the right. You know, I got this club. Like it's just it just makes thinking easier. Well, and that's the whole deal is like, again, you, you have to make a decision on something. And, and I do believe that just giving you a, here's a, there used to be a step-by-step -step process. Here's your pre-shot routine, but no one could, you could never talk about target selection without the data. It was all just, well, this is an easy, a green light situation. Let's get more aggressive. What does that mean? Like mm -hmm. it literally meant nothing until actually quantifying the data. And, and that's the other thing that I started to say earlier, and I don't think I ever got around to it was, if there's any one thing that I think I have brought to the game that's different, it's this idea of expectation management, because not that Rotel is amazing, like all these old, I just hate saying old is a negative way, the older sports psychologist golf mindset guys, without the data, you couldn't tell us, hey, an eight foot putt is 50-50, man. It's a coin flip. Don't freak out when you miss it. It's not that big of a deal. Sure, they would say, hey, don't freak out. It's not that big of a deal. But like, here's the data why. Mm -hmm. And it's like, once you understand it, 100 yards in the rough on the PGA Tour, they average over par. 165 yards on the PGA Tour in the fairways where they average par. Like, that's a nine iron for these guys. You're going to make some birdies. It's about eliminating the stupid bogeys. That is what the game is all about. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny when you have the data, it just makes it golf a little bit easier. I wish I would have had this about 15 years ago, but appreciate you. Appreciate you getting it all out and making it better every every iteration for the last question. Just curious. What do you think is your proudest moment in golf? You've done so much with professionals, your own game, how much you've given back to people, like you said, all over the world. What do you think is your biggest uh, or proudest moment? The, the two that come to mind are making it to the final stage of PGA Tour Q school as a 35 year old amateur. That was a really cool accomplishment um and then the second one would be caddying for zalatoris when he won the u.s junior uh, th this kid he qualified for the u.s junior at 12 13 14 years old you know and he, he he was improving each year but he just wanted to win that tournament i just remember I mean, again the the kid hit the ball like he does now when he was 12 it just, just was wild. everything was smaller <laughs> like yeah. he just did hit it as far didn't have as much but it, his swings the same like everything about it. the kids just good at golf and then he ran into the trouble with the putter starting when he was about 14 or 15 and he he just i remember i can't remember exactly how he did when he was 15 but i just remember telling him when he got home like if you just stay patient you got a couple years left stay patient you're gonna be one of the best junior golfers in the world for sure you're gonna have a great opportunity to win this tournament and then he didn't qualify when he was 16 um and he was pretty beat up and so then to kind of accidentally that was when i was first starting to really comb through the data to start creating decade and then to go caddy for him and and you know help him win the u.s junior was it's funny because that that in looking that was probably the the highlight of my golf career, honestly, is just because I'd watch this kid put the blood, sweat and tears in that we all have at that age with no results, nothing to show for it. And then just to be able to show him like, Hey, it's just this, like this, this, this part that you're missing. 
and and to just watch him go on from what he's done since then has obviously been amazing. We need a golf documentary about that. I think that'd be a great one. I'd watch that. You know, what's funny is when when he finished second at the Masters that year as a non-member, a, a bunch of people text me like, if he'd won, that's a movie. And I was like, you know, I'd never really thought about it, but I mean, it but probably... It they probably, didn't win in Moneyball though, right? And that's a great movie. That's true. Yeah. There, there you go. I still get juiced every time I watch Moneyball. Though. Like, <laughs> I always think about you when I see it on Netflix. <laughs> it's such a good movie. <laughs> well, Scott, I appreciate it again, man. You are uh, endless knowledge and uh, the audience loves it. So thanks again for, for all you've done for the game and continue to do, man. Always, man. Congrats to you on everything you've accomplished too. It's really cool to see your book back there and Tiger staring me down. So <laughs> congrats to you.